We're going to move on now uh, in our lectures on perturbation theory to consider one of the classic and most widely used methods available to us, which is what's called multiple scale expansions. And so this is a very generic platform that builds on the ideas of regular perturbation theory and poincare Lindstedt to offer, in some sense, a more flexible platform to do perturbation calculations and to understand the effects of perturbations on different nonlinear problems in particular. Okay? And so this is going to build on what we've already talked about in terms of regular perturbations and as well as in terms of poincare lindstedt methods. Now, in both these cases, uh, in fact, they break down. Uh, you know, all techniques have their limitations. And what we know already is that uh, in regular perturbation theory, this is going to break down uh, due to things like secular growth. So what you've already seen this is that if you do just a regular perturbation expansion, typically that's not going to be the best method available to you except for maybe looking at perturbations of eigenfunction problems. But anytime you have time involved, if you do your corrections, when you do regular perturbation theory, oftentimes your correction in the right-hand side terms uh, live in the null space, which generates secular growth terms. And so it's problematic because, in fact, regular perturbation theory is not equipped to handle that. poincare lindstedt overcame that difficulty by allowing, for instance, for the solutions which were assumed fundamentally to be periodic in nature, uh, the poincare lindstedt allowed for frequency changes to happen. So essentially, poincare lindstedt is really geared towards problems where oscillations are the sort of the leading order state of that system and what the poincare lindstedt allows is for you to compute shifts in frequencies due to perturbations. And in fact, perturbations do two things generically. They shift frequencies, they generate harmonics, and so poincare lindstedt allowed you to accommodate that whereas regular perturbation did not. But poincare lindstedt also breaks down because that's the only thing it allows you to happen. It only allows you to com compute these frequency shifts and many behaviors aren't just periodic in nature but have uh, more interesting dynamics. It could be frequency shifts plus some other kind of behaviors. And let's, so we're going to go through some examples and show where this happens so that you can start to see that we need to also move beyond poincare lindstedt methods. So, what is the main concept behind a multiple scale perturbation expansion? The idea is to, de de is to define a new time variable, tau. Tau is epsilon t. This is often called a slow scale. If epsilon is small, think about this. If t goes from, zero to time, from time zero to time one, then tau is only going to go from zero to a small amount because of that epsilon there. In fact, if epsilon is 0.1, for t going from 0 to 1, tau only goes from 0 to 0.1. So it's, it's like a slow time variable. And in fact, the smaller epsilon is, the slower this tau is in some sense. So what we're going to introduce is this slow variable. And it's another time variable, but it's going to be independent of t. Even though obviously you see here, I've made it that tau is just epsilon t, we're going to treat it as a separate independent variable, this slow time tau. And so I'm going to rewrite the problem as a function of both t and tau. And in fact, in multiple scale theory, you can often introduce an arbitrary number of slow and fast variables. You might introduce a fast variable, which would be tau is equal to t over epsilon. And we'll, we, we will be actually be doing that later when we consider boundary layer theory. But for now, we're just going to say multiple scale expansion. We're going to introduce a new time, uh, new time scale, which is tau. But unlike poincare lindstedt where we introduced a new time scale and just work with that time scale, I'm keeping my original time scale t as well. So now I have t and tau. So how does this work? So here's the idea behind the expansion method. You're going to do an expansion. You're going to have your base solution, u0, is going to be some function of x and t. And now our corrections, u1, you know, epsilon u1, epsilon squared u2, are going to be function of x, t, and tau. So I'm treating tau as an independent variable now. So I have to rewrite my equations with this tau because I'm going to do expansions of this form. It's going to be both in t and in tau as well as x. And this is generic for like arbitrary spatial temporal systems. 
So when you plug that in, what does this do for you? Well, here's what it does for you. If you start to collect and you just look at you know, your generic system, you're going to get some in the leading order solution. Do you know do you not dt is equal to some nonlinear evolution? So this is like your leading order solution where all your perturbations are zero. But in the next order, what you're going to get is d1, d2 is equal to some linear operator, function of u0, u1, plus f u0, u0 tau. Remember, now I have to count for the slow variability of u0, which is u0 tau. The important thing here is f1 and f2, what are they going to have to satisfy? The Fredholm alternative. So what I've got myself the ability to do is to define the evolution, the slow evolution of u, such that f1 and f2 and f3 and all the right-hand side forcings actually satisfy the Fredholm alternative theorem. And if they satisfy the Fredholm alternative theorem, then I can go around, uh, go about and uh, find solutions to this. And remember, the Fredholm alternative is that that f1 has to be orthogonal to the null space of the adjoint of the operator L. So again, this solvability condition just keeps popping up everywhere we look. And here it is, again. So if I solve this leading order problem, I find some solution. Let's call it u0, which is a function of x of t. But also, it could have some constants in there. Let's call them a and b. Now, the important thing about the multiple scales is this is a solution of x and t, but really, these constants aren't constants anymore. They can, in fact, be dependent upon slow time tau. So that's explicitly here. So the idea is that wherever I look at my leading order solution, the constants that I have in the leading order solution actually now can vary as a function of the slow time scales that I have in the problem. So A is not a constant. It's a function of tau. B is not a constant. It's a function of tau. This dependence on slow time is critical because of what it allows me to do at the next order correction, in fact, is to define evolution equations for A and B in the slow time scale so that solvability is satisfied. That's what I'm looking for. When we did poincare linstead when we did the expansion, remember we expanded the frequency, omega naught plus omega 1 plus omega 2. We were trying to use the omega 1 and the omega 2, the frequency corrections, to get rid of the terms that were going to lead to secular growth. Here, we're going to specify the evolution of A and B for what purpose? Get rid of the secular growth. Make it so that solvability conditions are satisfied. Enforce the evolution of A and B on the slow time scale such that that, that is true. That's the concept. That's the concept behind doing multiple scale expansions. Give yourself freedom to write down some kind of uh, mechanism that allows you to keep to satisfy solvability conditions, and in this case here, is that I can specify some evolution of A and B on the slow scale such that I have solvability satisfied. So I'm going to work through an example and show you how this works out. So here is the example here. And this example is different than the poincare linstead method uh, example because I now have damping. And what happens with damping is damping itself, right, leads, I have a small amount of damping here, so solutions can decay, and this epsilon here shifts frequencies. So this one here shifts frequency. If you just had this, poincare linstead would work. But now you have this damping term, so there are things also happening to the amplitude of your solutions, and this is something that poincare linstead can't account for, because poincare linstead only allows flexibility in shifting frequencies. So the question is, can multiple scales handle such a case where I have shifts in frequencies and I have shifts in amplitudes? So first of all, let's write down the exact solution to this problem. This is just a second order linear constant coefficient differential equation. You put in exponential solutions, and here's what you find. You find that, in fact, your solutions are some exponent, e to the minus epsilon t, in other words, there's a small amount of dampening, that's why you get that minus epsilon t, cosine, 
an e to the minus t sine, and you have these uh, amplitudes in front of them. Okay. So that's an exact solution. And so the, one of the questions is, I can plot this, and I can ask the question, all right, so I have an exact solution, but if I were to approximate this in a perturbation theory, what would happen? And notice that I get shifts in the amplitude and shifts in the frequency. So I have to accommodate that. And I know Poincaré, Poincaré Lindstedt can't do it. And we already know that regular perturbation theory can account for frequency shifts. Poincaré Lindstedt can, but Poincaré Lindstedt cannot account for the amplitude changes. And so this multiple scales, as we'll show, actually can do both. By defining this extra time variable, we can get both frequency shifts and amplitude shifts. So here's how it works. Your solution u is no longer a function of t. It is a function of t and tau, where tau is this slow time variable. Tau is epsilon t. Later, we're going to talk about what if this was not epsilon, but epsilon to the 1 half, or some other scaling. In fact, what we'll do is some dot, what's called dominant balance physics and start to understand how do I scale that epsilon to make the problem self-consistent. But for now, we can just use this epsilon t and it will illustrate everything we want in, in, in this uh, for what we're going to do for the case here. So that's the big deal there. I was, this was a function of just t. Now it's a function of t and tau. So what happens then? So the big thing that happens is now I'm working with two variables. So a time derivative, u of t, I have to account for the fact that I'm now working with t and tau. So my chain rule tells me u of t is u of t plus u of tau, tau of t. Okay, I just used the chain rule on this. And tau of t, the derivative of tau with respect to t is just epsilon. So the u of t becomes u of t plus epsilon u tau. Two derivatives of this gives me u t t plus 2 epsilon u t tau plus epsilon squared u tau tau. So you can already see that I'm going to start getting extra terms with the inclusion of this second time scale. So if I have this as a function of t and tau, those derivatives just produce for me this term, this term, and this term. Two of those are order epsilon terms. So they're going to start playing a role almost immediately in terms of helping us understand how to essentially eliminate secular growth terms with appropriate enforcement of conditions on slow parameters. So now we expand. Here is the generic expansion. Expand my solution, u naught t tau, epsilon u1, u t tau, epsilon squared, so forth, and plug in. And here's what you get. So I, it's pretty small here, but what you have find is that order 1, it's u naught t t plus u naught is equal to 0. So this is very simple. Your leading order equation, remember, is it was a small amount of damping, small amount of frequency shift. So the leading order equation is just sines and cosines. Okay. Next, equation, next order is u1 tt plus u1. Here's your right hand side terms. There they are with initial conditions. Then at the next order, here's the left hand side. Here are the right hand side terms with initial conditions. So again, I took this problem and through perturbation theory, I wrote it as a hierarchy of problems that are in, easier to solve, right? So this is easier to solve than the original equation. But now I'm starting to get non-homogeneous equations that I have to solve. But again, they're all linear. So you know, I just turned this into a hierarchy of linear each problem. Linear problem is easier than my original problem. But that's how you would do this. So what are the results of this? Well, the first solution is just cosines and sines. Cosine t plus sine t. Normally, we just put a constant in front of each. C1 cosine t plus C2 sine t. But remember. This is a solution of both ta tau and t. And those constants aren't constants anymore. In fact, that constant a is now dependent on tau. That constant b now dependent upon tau. So what I've got here now is a shift in my solution form. It's not just sines and cosines. Those constants that are there are now allowed to change on the slow time scale. And I'm going to use that to our advantage when we go to apply the solvability conditions. I'm going to enforce the evolution of how it evolves slowly for A and B, such that I satisfy solvability. 
just like when we did Poincaré Linstead, when we expanded the frequency, we picked the frequency corrections such that we get rid of the secular growth terms. Okay? Same thing here. So, let's go to the next order. I have the leading order solution. The next order, here it is. Here's the governing equation on the left. Here's the right-hand side forcing term. And when I put in my leading order solution into the right-hand side forcing, here's what I get. And notice what I have there. I have, I have these terms here in front of the cosine t, these terms here in front of the sine t. Cosine t and sine t are the null space terms. I have to get rid of them or else I will have secular growth. And this is completely fictitious. Again, the secular growth is fictitious. It is, a, it is simply an artifact that you have not satisfied the solvability condition. So what I want to do then is take this, set it to zero. So then if that coefficient is zero, the cosine's out. Take this coefficient, set it to zero, then the sine's out. So the cosine and sine terms, those coefficients are now gone. And so now I don't have any problem with solvability, right? Nothing's living in the null space. No secular growth terms. And what the solvability then gives me is this. A of tau, in other words, I get differential equations for A and B that if they're satisfied, then the Fredholm alternative is satisfied. So there you go. Two linear first order differential equations. They're coupled. And in fact, what you can do is you can multiply the first by A, the second by B. This is what you have here. And in fact, 2AA tau is the derivative of A squared tau. 2BB tau is the derivative of B squared tau. And we're going to do a little bit of fancy manipulations here to just simply show that if you use these two equations together, the simplification is that this is, this is essentially what that equation is. You add them together, and you have A squared plus B squared tau is equal to minus 2 A squared plus B squared. So this is a first order differential equation in terms of A squared plus B squared. So it really simplifies nicely down in my evolution. And so a squared plus b squared is just some constant e to the minus 2 tau. And then if I break this out to the initial conditions that I had, you find the following. a of tau is some constant alpha e to the minus t cosine c of t. b tau is alpha e to the minus t sine c of t. And I can determine these c of t's, c of tau, excuse me, by specific initial conditions that would be imposed on that system. Right? So I haven't brought in the initial conditions that I had in the system. That's what would determine those. But notice what I've done. I've enforced now some dynamics on the system so that I don't have an, uh, a null space problem anymore. And what it gave me is, look at these, e to the minus tau plus some cosine c. And so this is a damping term, which is minus epsilon tau. Remember, tau is a slow variable. It's minus epsilon t. So this is a slow damping. Remember, I did have a perturbative amount of damping. So this is giving me, in fact, the amplitude decay of the solutions, a perturbative correction to it. So at leading order, here's what you get. So I modify this to leading order, and here is my solution. I have alpha e to the minus tau. And I put everything in here, which when I rewrite it, I get it to be here. Alpha e to the minus tau cosine t plus tau over 2. Now tau is epsilon t over 2. So this is giving me a cosine of t plus epsilon of t over 2. That epsilon t over 2 is a frequency correction. So just this simple model on this shows me that not only do I get the slow decay of this model, I also get a epsilon frequency shift to this model. In fact, if I were to take the original Taylor series ex expansion of the, of the exact solution, let me go back to it. Remember, in this case, we're doing a linear model, so you can work this completely out. There is the, there's the exact solution to the problem I was just solving. And if I take this, and if I do a Taylor expansion of this exact solution, Remember, epsilon is small, so I'm, I'm, I'm Taylor expanding about, Taylor series expanding about epsilon equals zero. And if I expand that around that, then what you find at the next order, leading order term in the correction, is exactly this here. 
So the Taylor series expansion of the exact solution agrees exactly with this perturbation calculation using multiple scales. So you start to see the idea. The multiple scales aren't constrained just to getting frequency shifts. They can also get amplitude shifts. So it's a much more flexible framework because it allows you for actually capturing a broader set of dynamics. So multiple scale expansions are used everywhere, they're ubiquitous, right? Because it allows us to understand a much broader variety of different uh, models that don't just have oscillations, but also have growth and decay and so forth. And so this framework of, of, of defining multiple scales is, is really powerful. What we'll also show later when we consider pattern forming systems is you don't have to just do multiple scales in time. You can also do multiple scales in time and space. And these multiple scales expansions allow you, by defining these slow and, slow and fast times, uh, slow, uh, you know, short and large uh, uh, temp uh, spatial domains, allow you a great deal of flexibility in understanding many problems that are out there where nonlinearity is driving some of the physics. And so I, uh, I'm excited to show you the next example of this. We'll work out an example in full detail with this multiple scale expansion technique, but it's really important that you understand that this is a very powerful tool allowing you this flexibility of s basically satisfying the solvability conditions by imposing a second time scale and imposing the evolution on the slow scale such that you can satisfy the Fredholm alternative.